Welcome, Brian. How you doing? Thanks, man. Doing good. Well, congrats on the launching of the podcast. Looking good. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Of course, man. A pleasure to have you. Um, I, I'd like to start. What? Where did your journey start with sales? How did you first get introduced to the high ticket world? Uh, I mean, the first ever. Well, it starts with the internet world, right? So I got introduced to Gary V when I was going through college. And before I got into Gary V, it was a bit interesting. So uh, how it all started, was long story short, is from the pickup artist world. And so how it all started, I was 19 years old at that time. And I, at that point, what I like to call is I was socially retarded, meaning that <laughs> I basically had no friends. I'm kind of being serious. So I had no friends. I had uh, no girlfriend, virgin. And I see my friends in my high school, you know, just talking to girls and you know, having female friends and just having and enjoying life essentially right so i was like man the more i see that it's just the more it was just like almost like stomping me into the ground it felt like and so it got to a point where i'm like man i, I really hate where my life is at right now and i really hate who i am at right now and so i was mm -hmm. so desperate one day I, I i couldn't sleep until four in the morning and i schooled the next day and so i went to google and search how to talk to girls now you need to have some level of desperation in order to search those keywords into Google. And so what I found was these, these you know those uh, prank videos where on college campuses they go up, it's like they do those, like cheesy pickup lines and stuff like that. And of course, this was back in I think like 2016. And when I first saw that, I was like, do you can go up and talk to people like strangers? <laughs> it blew my fucking mind because I come from Korea. Korea, we don't do that shit. So I'm like, wow, this is insane. And so I started doing that. I started to going up to, you know, girls and random people to work on my social skills because, man, I, I want to be like that. I want to be able to talk to people. I want to have that skill. And so I started reading sales books. I wasn't even in sales back then. So I started reading books like uh, The Way of the Wolf, classic, uh, 10X Rule, and uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, all those kind of books. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't know that I would need those at one point. It just said, I just started reading them because I wanted to get pe better with people in general, right? And so at 19, long story short, uh, and then I started getting to Gary V because the, uh, it kind of one thing leads to another, right? So like dating leads to personal development, personal development leads to like, you know, kind of like do your own thing. And so I remember being in the shuttle bus, I was like this, like holding onto the thing where there's like other people like, you know, looking just as depressed as me in the shuttle bus in college. <laughs> at like seven in the morning trying to go to class. And in my wired headphones back in the days, Gary would scream into my ears, drop out of college, college is a scam, college is bullshit. And I was like, all right, I mean, sounds reasonable. So I dropped out. And after that, uh, I started promoting at clubs. So I became a club promoter, uh, long story short, which it sounds like kind of, kind of like degenerate, but also it was good in a way because it forced me to get better with people again, because it, it in a way is a bit of a sale, just not like the the thing we talk about in high ticket, right? So you go up to mm -hmm. girls and it's like you're trying to bring the girls into the clubs, right? And so you got to make them a good offer, right? What's the good offer? Hey, we got a table, champagne, there we go, right? DJ playing. And then you got to sell the guys as well, right? You got to sell the tables because, hey, and how do you sell them? Well, what do they want? Well, they want to be around girls, right? Hey, listen. Girls, you want blonde girls, white girls, what do you want, right? So it, it, that I had to get better with just approaching people, right? It's not cold calling, it's cold approaching people in a way. And I wasn't like, you know, I made some money with that, but like barely anything. And uh, if anyone ever worked in nightlife, they know how uh, miserable it is. Your 9 to 5 isn't 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., but it's 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Because clubs sure. in Korea go until like, uh, they open until like 10 in the morning. Korean people are crazy. And I did that for a bit. And then I went to the military, which is like the total fucking opposite. Right? So I went this like crazy, like inconsistent lifestyle with like champagnes and like these like model girls and then like DJs to in the middle of bumfung nowhere in Korea, just like marching in the middle of like, the countryside. Right? <laughs> Shit like that. And so when I was there in the beginning, it was it was a bit tough. I think the military was the the hardest thing I've ever done, and it wasn't even something crazy. Like I was on like mad, you know, shooting in in Afghanistan. It wasn't even like that. But during the time in the beginning, I was trying to get hold of like, okay, I got to figure this out. And as I climb up the ranks a little bit, now I start have more breathing room to have a bit more free time. And mm -hmm. during that free time, uh, we had these computer rooms. 
So at that time, we didn't have full access to our cell phone, but we could go into the computer room. It was kind of limited access. You kind of have to sneak into that because you don't want your superior officers to see you because if they see you in the back of your mind, you're like, oh man, I'm going to look bad if they see me in the, in the computer room because it was like a high status thing in the military, right? And so I'll sneak in at times at five in the morning or like at 9 p.m. when the, you know, my superiors wouldn't be there. And I was watching these YouTube videos and one video popped up and the video started with something like, so I'm a 17 year old high school dropout. So if anybody knows back in the days, they know which video I'm talking about. So it's from the infamous Iman Ghazi video talking about starting a social media marketing agency. And so we're going to come back full circle to your question. And so I'm like, dude, that's crazy. Like this guy's, this kid's 17. They're making like this much money and apparently like as easy. Oh, okay. So he was talking about his course. Right to how to start a social media marketing agency, get to 10k a month. I was like, man. But the course I think at the time was 900 bucks US. My salary in the military at the time was around 150 US dollars a month, and I was working around 80 to 90 hours a week, with no days off, being cut off from civilization, not seeing friends or family, and my sleep schedule was very inconsistent. So one day I started at 8 a.m., one day I would start at 2 a.m., one day I started at 12 p.m. It was like, so I was jet lagged for the entirety of the two years. But it's funny, it's, if you're in an environment where you're forced to do something, you just, human beings, you just figure it out. It's, it's the funny thing. But mm. I was like, okay, man, fuck, I, 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 I should probably do this, but this is worth like, like six, seven months of my fucking salary working 80 hours a week. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> So I was like, I was hesitant. And one day they did a sale. It was like 700 bucks. He's like, guys, it's not going to last that long for like the next few days. I was like, fuck, I need to do it. So I snuck into the computer room again and I was typing in the, the card digits from the keyboard. And I remember my hand was literally like shaking until like pressing enter. I was like, shit. And then I did it Ugh! and I did it. And then I started that. Um, long story short, I was not successful at it. <laughs> Uh, I, I take responsibility for that. It's just, I just didn't know what the fuck I was doing. So that's, that's on me. But eventually I stumbled into the world of, okay, instead of starting a business, you know what people say, right? Just learn one high income skill instead of trying to do delivery marketing, all that kind of shit, the common marketing message in the, in the sales world. Okay. Well, this makes sense. Let me learn this and then I'll figure it out. Let me work for somebody. Cause I also saw a video from Alex Hermosi talking about that. And, um, mm. I had a like life mentor at the time who sent me the video. I was like, just learn one high income skill, work for somebody. And then later on, you can start a business after you learn that skill and stack some bread. I was like, okay. So at the time I had a buddy who was already in quote unquote high ticket closing. He hates that term by the way, but he's like, Hey dude, you're doing the high ticket closing thing. Can you help hook me up with a gig? I was like, yeah, sure. And then I landed an interview and then I, I started right away. And that buddy's name is June. Thanks, June. We're still friends to this day. Shout out, June. Exactly. And so that's how I got started. And what was that first offer? Where did you, uh, where did you land on that first interview? It was a biz op. So ironically enough, helping people start a social media marketing agency. (laughs) You're really good at that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's the irony. I was like, yeah, about that. Anyways, so yeah, it's a biz op. Right. So someone in their nine to five job. I think that that business or the sales agency was doing it, but the sales agency was doing a pretty good job of targeting people in like their thirties to maybe fifties. And so these mm-hmm. people had more money, right? And so it's not it was not like they're, they're not super wealthy because in biz op you just have a lot of broke people. But I think these people have more money saved up, and so. Yeah, that was it. I mean, in the beginning, I was fucking terrible at it. You know, I was going in. I was like, yeah, I can talk to people. I'm like, I'll be good at sales. And then, <laughs> you know, I, was, you know, I think first month I finished at like 2K a month, you know. So it's not like it's like the typical thing. Like I didn't come out of nowhere. It's like, oh, like I started with like 10K a month. Like, OK, cool. And I got very lucky with that deal. So we had different price points. So we had a, I think, 4K, 10K and a 25K and a 50K. But I wasn't allowed to sell the 50K because I was a new, uh, new rep coming in. But I remember there was a prospect that came in. He's probably in his 50s. We did all over the phone, no Zoom. So I don't know exactly how old he was, but maybe he was in his 50s, it sounded like. And he was one of those A-type people, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I saw the ad. So what do you guys do? I was like, 
uh sir we'll we'll get into that in a bit but you know do you know what you're looking for <laughs> i was doing that shit and uh and then but he was one of those people where he was a top butter like very direct to the point it's like okay and i was like i can tell this guy has money i think he was making like 100 grand a year or like 200 grand a year i was like well let me sell him the big package let's see what happens so i pitched him the 25k he's like okay how do i pay uh you can do bank wire it's like okay what's the details i was like here you go and then he paid and i was like <laughs> i made two can comms I like, but it was very very lucky like blind not uh blind squirrel finds a nut right so you know he would have bought it anyway but i just happened to just that was my first sales call i think so i was like whoa okay that's cool i'm at 2k <laughs> with no delivery that, that is awesome that is awesome I, i've never heard that story i really like that <laughs> yeah but it was, it was great because i'm like man i sell this because before I was come from like the business world, right? Like social media marketing, I was doing some copywriting and like you have to deliver, but here you sell them and you never talk to them. I was like, oh my God, this is great. I'm done, move on to the next one. So it was like, it was like a eye-opening moment. I'm, dude, I gotta keep doing this. So it was like an eye-opening moment for me. Was it almost like a bit of a drug? You know what I mean? You get that hit, you're like, wait, you're telling me I don't have to do everything else? I just get to have the conversation and, and go and do it again and get paid again. Yeah, and also at the same time, when you're starting something new for the first time, you have that eager to get better at that, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I really had that because I think there was about 25 reps on that sales team, and I was told number 23 when I first started okay. out. And so I was at the bottom of the barrel, and then they show the leaderboard. And so when you see that, you're like, shit, I, I, don't, I don't think these people are better than me. As arrogant as it sounds, I don't mean by that in a way that like they're better at like, the sales skill set. I mean like – as a human being, I don't think they're any special. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I'm just like, they're human beings just like me. I don't think, that, and I'm looking at these people on the huddles, right? And they, they look like regular human beings. They don't look as sharp as me. Cause I was like, so I was living in my parents' house at the time in Korea. And I, I really wanted to get out of there. Right? And I was grateful for the fact that my parents provide me with a roof. But I'm like, man, like I, I want to get out of my parents' house. I want to be out there. Cause I'm scrolling through Instagram. I'm seeing these kids out in Miami, out in Dubai, out in Monaco, out in Europe. I'm like, why am I not doing that? And obviously social mm -hmm. media is fake, it's very out of context. But when I saw it, I'm like, I, I know I can be doing that. And so because I had that, I was like, dude, I'm going to figure this shit out. And so I, we can get into that as well, but I did everything in my power possible to make sure I was going to get out of my parents' house, number one. And also I'm going to get really good at this. And I didn't know where it was going to lead me to, but I knew... Dude, I, I'm like, this is the intention I'm making. I'm going to get the right help. I'm going to get to put in the right effort and time and money into this to figure this out. And how long were you on that offer? How long did you stay with that company for? Uh, I think two, three months. Okay. And during that time, what, like, had you gotten to where you wanted to be? Had, were you able to move out or what happened in those first two to three months? Yeah, for sure. So first month I did 2K in comms. I think second month, I either also did 2K or I think I shot up to 8.4K or something, right? Um, so or something. 8.3 something. Like, I have the commission check somewhere. Maybe we can put it up. But I had that. and uh, But it didn't happen because of no reason. So what happened was I think I was in that offer for about, like, two weeks. And then there was – I was in a group chat with, like, three other reps. June was one of them. And there's also another rep there that was – I think he was one of the top three reps. And he, I think he was also not able to sell the 50K. But if he were able to sell the 50K, I think he would have been maybe number two or maybe number one. I think he was number three in the company out of 25. And so I was talking to him. He's like, and I've listened to his calls. Like, dude, like, your calls are good. What, what did you do? And he's like, oh, dude, I went through this program. He's like, what's the program? And he's like, oh, it's called Inner Circle. It's like, okay. The NEPQ inner circle. He's like, yeah, yeah. Because I've heard of Jeremy and Matt and that that whole ecosystem. Like I'm familiar. I've sure. seen their videos. I've seen I've tried some of their like YouTube videos and some of their low ticket stuff. And so I was like, but I, I never went into like a high ticket promo of theirs. So like inner circle, huh? Okay. So in my here's the thought I had. So at that point, I'm like, hmm. I'm two weeks into sales. Maybe I should wait two more weeks. Like, see how the month pans out. So this is a, maybe a common thought that people may have, right? It's like, ah, maybe I'll just like see how it goes. And mm -hmm. then that's the thought, exact thought I had. And then I was taking a walk outside 
it was during cherry blossoms in Korea. So beautiful like cherry blossoms, right? Like pink flowers. And I was taking a walk on the sideway and then I stopped. And then I thought to myself, well, that's fucking stupid. Why would you wait longer to get to your goal? Like, what if you could get to your goal sooner by starting earlier, getting the right help earlier? And so I'm like, well, yeah, that, make, that makes sense. So I pulled out my phone in that exact moment. It's like, I texted that guy. I was like, hey, dude, like, can you intro me with Jeremy Sales guy? I was like, okay, cool. He put me in a group chat and uh, the guy, the sales guy was in Australia. So Korea, Australia, same time zone, right? So, because mm -hmm. during that time, American people would have been sleeping at them. But I was like, okay, cool. So uh, I hopped on a sales call after I, got, I just like walked back home. I was like, okay, cool. So let's hop on a call. And then I talked to the guy. I bought after 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, and what did you have to your name at this time? Like around thirty five hundred, I think. So I had about five hundred dollars in my bank account and three k in my PayPal account, if I remember. So jack shit. So not a lot, and you know, so I hopped in a call. The guy didn't even pitch me. It's funny enough. It's I don't think I had a salesperson actually properly take me through a sales call. It's usually maybe they see that I'm a lay down, maybe you know. So they usually go like, hey, like they ask me some like casual questions, and like they just, hey, this is how it works, and then I buy because my car's already out. So, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm talking to the guys like, yeah, man, okay, cool, like, da -da -da -da. okay, here's how it works, it's this much. And I think the program was like three k a month at that time. So for six months, I was like, hmm, okay, so it's eighteen grand, I think. So and then I have three k, and then okay, you guys do the payment plan. They're like, yeah, okay, so here's the deal: I have three k in my PayPal account. But I can't like take it out because it wouldn't connect. Let me connect it to my bank. So do you guys accept PayPal? It's like, yeah, we do. We just gotta have our uh, invoice team just send you a PayPal invoice. All right, let's do that then. So I'm like, okay, cool. So they send me an invoice. I pay, and then that's how I did it. And then I got into the program. Also, another thing too, like the the, the coaching calls there were like three, four a.m. my time. And so it also boggled my mind when I started selling the program or. You know, when I started selling like other coaching programs, the people be like, oh man, but the calls are at 8 p.m. Motherfucker, I was getting up at four in the morning to take these coaching calls. <laughs> you know, so because I had that, because I didn't buy into my own limitations, I wasn't saying that to them. Sometimes I would say if I had that relationship with that prospect, but sure. you know, you don't want to take it out of context. But, but because I had that, because I didn't buy into my own limitations, because I didn't wait until two weeks later when things hopefully got better, because I didn't bitch and moan about the calls being too early it became easier for me to overcome objections i'm not the best at objection handling but it's just at least i sat there and i was able to challenge and help see help people see from from a different angle because i didn't buy into my own limitations so why should i let you buy into yours if my job is to put yourself put get help you get you in a better position you know i think you had the one thing that so many sales people lack which is congruency you know, that they, they are offering and they're asking their prospects to do something that they would never do themselves. Oh, yeah. And, and you had the exact opposite, right? Like you came from a situation where, you know, you, you have every reason to be like, fuck it. It's not going to work for me. You know, it's four in the morning. It, it's way more money than I ever had. But you didn't make excuses. Why do you think you didn't make excuses and you just went for it? Yeah, good question. I wasn't even scared during that time, by the way. I was in like, oh, man, what if this doesn't work? I wasn't even thinking that. I was like, again... There's a there's a book called Reality Transurfing. It's a very woo woo book. So it's about have you heard of that book, Liam? I, I don't think I have. What was it again? A reality Transurfing is written by a Russian author. And what it basically is about is law of attraction backed up by quantum physics. So okay. this this may because I'm not a, a woo woo guy like oh like work on your mind. I'm not that guy at all. But I read that book, I think, a few years ago, just because I had like so many people um, just tell me I should read it, right? So I had maybe like three or four people that, you know, that told me I should read it. I was like, okay, fine, I'll fucking read it. And looking back at it now, I think there's a lot of woo-woo parts that I don't resonate as much. But one thing I do resonate with is setting an intention. And so, which mm -hmm. sounds like a very common sense thing, but it's like a setting an intention. Okay, my, my intention is to get better at this. My intention is to have, my, have a better life for myself. And after you set that, it's not like you're getting pumped up like, yeah, I'm going to do this shit. But it's like, okay, this is the intention. I'm just going to take steps towards it. As simple as that. So because I set that intention, it's like, okay, cool. Like this is the logically, these are the steps I got to take. 
I don't know how to do this. And quite frankly, I don't have enough, like, I'm not going to waste time into this because maybe if we have time, we'll get into another story. But because even back then, I think I was like 25, 24. But ever since I was 21, I just had a different perspective on time because of the different things I saw. And so I never, you know, when when somebody's young, because, you know, whenever, if someone's listening to this, they may resonate where they have a prospect that hops on. Maybe they're younger, right? 18, 19, 20. And then they lack urgency in life in general because they 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 believe that the time is finite. Maybe not consciously, mm-hmm. but there's like, yeah, like it's like, you know, like life is life. It's that kind of thing. But I just know that's not true. And so because of that, I'm like, oh, dude, I don't have time. Right? So when I'm putting mm-hmm. in the input, I try to be as patient as possible. Meaning that when I'm taking the action, okay, I know after I take the action, it's going to take some time. But to take the action to get the right help, very, very impatient with that, right? So the output, the 10K a month, 20K a month, try to be as patient as possible, but the action in order to get there, it's like, oh, okay, I know I need to do this, I need to, I need to get this help, I need to get better at this, very, very impatient. So I guess the that, the intention and the, the impatience of the inputs outweighs the potential fear I could have had. And... I, I guess for yourself, right? Like fast forwarding a little bit, you you jump into the inner circle. You're starting to go through. You're getting the training. You're getting up at god awful hours to go through it. I know you then ended up getting recruited over to actually come sell inner circle. How did that come about? Yeah, so I was still on selling the first biz up offer, the SMMA one, and then uh, I hopped in the calls and I basically immersed myself into the whole training. And so the, the training portal. Like, I had Jeremy in my ears the whole time, you know? So when I was taking a walk, when I was at the gym, it was that or the coaching called recordings from Jeremy, Matt, or Marco, right, or whoever. And so it's a series of immersion. And then after that, so during my sales calls, and I also heard Matt say one time that, hey, during, guys, during your selling hours, just sell. Don't watch YouTube videos. Don't fuck around. Follow up, outbound, get referrals. So I heard that one time, and I just, like, immediately started doing it because I'm like, dude, this guy's making a lot of money. This guy's really good at sales. I'm paying this guy money. It's should probably listen. Kind of, <laughs> maybe I, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm crazy, but maybe I should do it. But it wasn't even like, ah, should I do it? Ah, maybe should I later do it? Okay, I should, okay. Immediately, like, boom, call these, call these, call these. And I think that's, a, that's one of the biggest reasons why when people take sales training programs, they don't succeed that much. It's because they, they think that just by getting into the program is somehow going to get them to their desired outcome. Or second, it's just going to the group coaching calls here and there, just going to get them to their promised land. But it's just not fucking true. Because I put in a lot of time and effort into that. Because I'm like, okay, during, a, during my selling hours, dial lead. Outside of that, I'm going to immerse myself. And also, it boggled my mind when I started selling 7th level programs. Is people say like, oh, man, I'll, I'll check in with these people, right? In order to get referrals and renew and upsell them. I, I kept in touch with every single one of the people I sold, unless they ghosted me. But... It boggled my fucking mind. After like 90 days, these people haven't done shit. I was like, I'm like, oh, dude, what happened? Oh, I just don't have that. I just don't have the time. Are you fucking kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? Like, it's like, yeah, but I have like, bro, you don't get it because I have two kids that are married. I don't care. We have plenty of people that are clients that actually put in the effort when they have like married with like five kids and two dogs. And also, what's the alternative? Because quite frankly, people don't care about your excuses. You shouldn't care about your excuses. But these people are like, oh, man, but it's busy, man. Oh, man, it takes effort. No shit. Anyways, so I'm already on my soapbox today and you love a name on Sunday. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I was going through that. Uh, so I, I immersed myself. I practice out a lot. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think another person asked me uh, about like one one dude was asking me about the Korean education system. Like, how is it? Well, the Korean education system, how it works is that when I was in high school, kids were in, in school from 7 a.m. to midnight. Wow. 7 a.m. to midnight. Some kids were there until 2 a.m. Okay. Sure. And they do that every day. And so it's basically very militant because the whole the whole goal, right? is for people to get into the top three universities in the country. 
And so, because that's a social narrative, because, hey, if you don't get into a good university, you have no future. If you don't get into a good university, your life's pretty much over, you know? And so, that's part of the reason why South Korea, by the way, has the highest suicide rate out of developed countries in the world. Mm -hmm. So, for the last decade in a row. And so, there's a dark side to it, but I guess the blessing in disguise with that is because that was the background I come from, is like, well, you memorize, you study it. And you just like rub, you drill it in and then you get the right feedback from the teachers. And so, so that's what me and June had. So, I mean, I don't think like, I'm like the best sales person in the world. Like I'm not gifted. Right. My, my tonality at the time was like really not that good. I think, you know, objection, I think I wasn't that good at it, but just from sheer old, oh, oh, duh, like memorize it. Okay. Say a lot, say a lot, say a lot until I cannot get it wrong. And so, and outside of the selling hours, how many hours were you putting into that? Like how many hours a day uh, would you say? I don't think I was like, let's, let's break it down. Right. So I would wake up around like three 30 in the morning and then I would confirm calls and then I would, you know, drink, drink water. I wouldn't even take a shower. So I just had like a cap on. Right. Uh, it's funny because sometimes people screenshot my, uh, my, uh, my zoom screen when I was going through inner circle It's like me wearing like a cap in like a dungeon with like a fucking hoodie. <laughs> Cause it was kind of cold in Korea back then. Cause I was, I woke up, I don't even like, Hey, is this Jack? Hey Jack, is this Brian? It's like, that was my day. Right? So that, and then take sales car from like 4 AM to 12 PM, sometimes 1 PM. If I have like a follow-up call with people in like PST, I do that. And then I would go to the gym or take a walk. Uh, and then I'd get back around like maybe 2 PM, maybe I eat. And then from like, I think from 2 PM to, I think like 7 PM, I was like doing sales training. Um, because American people will be asleep by then. So like, I couldn't call them. So during the time I was like, okay, like say hello, say hello, say hello. I think I was doing that. And I don't think that's necessary. It's just that I, my, my desperation was so big that I'm like, dude, like I, I, well, what else am I going to do? I like, I had, I felt like I had no choice. So, so yeah. So I think that's why like, you know, people see like, you know, two came on to like eight point, whatever came on. People like, you know, I, I posted that in the, going back to your question, Liam, I, I posted that in the client group. Right, the inner circle client group. And then you know what Jeremy does, right? Oh, good job, young grasshopper. Go post this in the sales revolution group, or I'm gonna have Marco come after. You know how he does it every time. <laughs> Love you, Jeremy, if you're watching this. So I was like, okay, and then I post it in the sales revolution group. And then uh Matt and I think Anthony and like Dan Van and those guys are like, dude, this is great. And then it's not like I had an intention of like I think people do that that I'm more these days, is like posting their results. I think that's great. I didn't even know that was a thing back then. I was like, oh, I'm just thankful that these people taught me. So I started making more money. So I was like, thanks, God. It was like a testimonial each time. But I think, so Matt reached out one day. I was like, hey, bro, you want to sell for a sales sniper account? And I saw that message. I was like, holy shit. Dude. It's on. Because at that time, like sales sniper. How did that feel? And it, I was like, holy shit. I was like, dude. It's like. I imagine if like actors in Hollywood, I was in LA one time, but or a few times, but I, I imagine that's what actors feel like if they get a call back from a movie director for a role they really wanted. They're like, holy shit, dude. Sales sniper, because like Sales Sniper and Seven Five, they were my dream roles, right? I was like, dude, no way. So I was like, dude, yes. And they're like, okay, cool. Like I'll set you up in an interview with Anthony. Anthony and I got on. It wasn't an interview. It was just like, hey, guys, uh, Brian, this is how it works. And so that moment but i was doing the math i was on a call with anthony uh anthony class act by the way and the desire like great great human being great leader savage of a salesperson obviously but i was talking to him and he's like hey man like these are the two offers like aussie time zone i was like oh aussie time zone that's good so i don't have to wake up at three in the morning but the the income potential was a lot lower so I was doing the math on that. And so, because in my other offer, I was earning in US dollars and the price point was like 5K, 10K, 25K. And I, uh, I think I was like, and then, and then with this offer, okay, cool. So it's Australian dollars and the price point was I think like 5K or 6K. And so mm -hmm. I was doing the math and I was like, hmm, I'm gonna be earning less money if all other factors are equal. But I wasn't even hesitating. I was like, dude, yeah, let's do it. And then while on that call, I messaged my sales manager at the company I was on at the time. I was like, yeah, listen, thanks for all you've done for me. Um, how many weeks do you need? Because, you know, I'm going to be moving on. You know, something I'm paraphrasing, but I think I put it pretty sure. well, but something like that. And then, yeah, basically, uh, after one week, I, I did two offers at the time. That other offer and then the sales sniper account. 
by the way, I don't know how people do like two, three offers in, at the same time. I'm like, dude, I can't do that. I'm like, dude, this, this is not good. This is like confusing. You know, I just don't prefer it. Anyways, so yeah, I did that. And then that's how I started for sale, selling for sales sniper account. It's for like an e-com biz up thing. And I think it was like a new offer coming in. And so uh, I think there were three other reps at the time. Uh, one was full-time and the other two are part-time. And first month, I outsold the other three reps combined by myself. So I think I sold 28 sales and then the other reps combined for like maybe 20 or something like that. And uh, and then after that, and there are different reasons for it. Again, I don't think I'm the best. I was going to say, what, what, what do you think you did differently though? Because like you, you may not be the best, but to come in and, and do what the rest of the team combined was doing, you know, there is definitely something going on. So what, what do you think allowed you to do that? Yeah, different reason. Number one, my show break was higher than everyone else's. That's that I realized that's my recurring theme with all the other offers. Cause like seventh level too, my show break was way higher than everyone else's. So like I don't think I was like the, the best at sales. And I just figured out other way to like talk to more leads in the same amount of time period, right? In the same amount of time window. So my show break was I think like fifteen, maybe twenty percent higher than everyone else on the first offer. And then also uh, when I was on the call, uh we didn't have upsells in that offer. So it was like just one front end. So, sure. uh, and the number two, I followed up with people, you know, like I did follow ups. Like if someone didn't buy, I was like, okay, let me talk to you again. Let me talk to you again. Let me talk to you again. Like I kept doing that. That's number two. And then another thing too is, uh, I just basically had speed, suspicion of disbelief and speed of implementation. Right. So, so what, what anything Anthony Vizari said I should do, I just shut the fuck up and did it. And, so, so the suspicion of disbelief and speed of implementation, I got this from a dating coach because what the dating coach is saying that, well, I, I mean, it really makes sense. Cause like if you implement quicker, then the quicker you're going to get feedback, whether it be positive feedback or negative feedback, right? So if you implement quicker, either it works right away. So you get the result right away. Or if you, if you immediately implement, but it still doesn't work, you get the feedback quicker. Oh, if I did that, I get this reaction. So maybe I should do mm. like this. Right. And so, and then step number one is suspension of disbelief. Cause a lot of people think like, nah, will this work? Maybe I should do it. And then they forget about it. Go back to their day to day. Oh, like, Oh, like laundry, you know, I should do that. You know? And so that's why if you, whenever you see people moving quicker, like they're mm. like their results are shining up. Quick, it's because they're like their inputs are quicker. Right. So I was doing that and things like, okay, do this, da, 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 da. Right. And especially in BizOp, I learned something. Also, I learned something from, from uh, Josh Sweetham and Anthony Vizari is in a BizOp sale for everybody watching. If you master these two frames, then you'll be pretty well off in BizOp. What number are those two one, frames you need to master? Number one, comfort zone. Number two, responsibility. So comfort zone, meaning that if you can help these people get outside of their comfort zone, then you have a high likelihood of those people moving forward. Number two, responsibility. If you can get your prospects, especially on a biz up, to take responsibility, then they have a higher likelihood of moving forward. So this kind of sounds obvious, but let me break it down in context. So comfort zone, the reason why comfort zone frame is very important, especially in biz up, is because these people are in a nine to five job. Now, if someone's in a nine to five job, what are they in? They're in a comfort zone. Because guess mm -hmm. what? They don't have to take any risks. They go to their job, same time, 9 a.m., clock in. Their boss gives them the thing, right? If the company goes down, like, they get sued or whatever, it's like, it's fine. They're fine because they're an employee, right? So they may not they just like... Go on to the next. What's that? Oh, I said they just go on to the next, you know? Yeah, so they may not like the job they, that they're in, but at least they know what they're getting, Right? They know they're going to okay. get 5K a month, like steady, da, 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 for most jobs, right? It's not like being in sales or being a trader, or being a business owner where like it's like performance based and things, different factors. Sure. So that's number one. So you, that's why they're so afraid of being a buying decision at the end because they're like, oh man, it's like unknown. All I've mm. known is known. It's like now it's like the unknown. What's going to happen? What if this doesn't work? They have more, more of that fear because of that. Number two, responsibility. They have not been taking responsibility because, ah, my boss sucks. Ah, my manager sucks. Us, the economy, man, Sally from the HR department. It's easy. So they have not been taking responsibility. And so because of that, and the general mass, the general population is like this, by the way. They're in victim mentality. They're feeling sorry for themselves. 
And because of that, it's, I mean, it's a correlation thing, right? Because of that, they're not getting the outcome that they want in their life because they're victimizing themselves, because they're not taking responsibility, right? Now, we can sit there and be like, oh, that sucks. Or we can be like, okay, well, that's the game I'm playing. Then I just got to play that game. I got to get better at playing that game. So, in the responsibility frame is whenever they're saying like, yeah, but the corona, yeah, but my wife, da, da, da. And then, you know how in like any PQ, there's a solution awareness section, right? So, mm-hmm. and that's, now I call it the pre-handling section because like you can pre handle like really good objections right there. And so, you know, Matt Ryder used to have a red line at consequence face of the script, meaning that until he got a good consequence, what happens if you don't do this? Well, it'll be suck because da, da, da. He did not move on. I had two red lines. On that, especially on that script. I want a consequence. I had one in that section right there. Mm-hmm. So before you start talking to me, what are they looking for ways to make more money so you don't have to feel stressed out or what have you been doing? And if this is like, oh, not really. Oh, why not? Ah, oh, you know, just just doing my research mode. Like, have you actually done something or just doing your research? Ah, oh, just doing research. How long have you done research for? For like the last three months. Can I offer a perspective on that? They're like, yeah, sure. So, I mean, have you ever considered that you're just being in a research mode, not getting outside of your comfort zone? And taking action has caused you to be in the position you're in now, just feeling stressed out for the last six months. They'd be like, oh, yeah, but I don't know if, you know, until, like, I don't know if what's the right thing for me. Well, what's the only way to find out? Well, I guess you actually got to do it. Yeah. So how much longer are you willing to prolong just being in research mode and just being stressed out? Yeah, I guess you're right. So how do you feel like your perspective needs to be different? Well, I guess I need to do something. Like what? I need to get outside my comfort zone. Yeah, we both know you need to, but are you willing to get outside of your comfort zone? Or are you just going to keep feeling stressed out being in research mode? No, I'm willing to. Why though? Well, because if I don't do anything, like, I'll go through that. Right? I have like a whole mm-hmm. decision around this. So like for all the common scenarios, I was like, okay, I have a reframe for this. I have a reframe for this. I have a reframe for this. You know? So I think that I was actually psyched whenever they gave me an excuse in that section. Ah, oh, you know, I didn't have the time. I was like, yes. Because after you get them buying into your frame, they see you more of an authority. Mm. after they buy into your frame. So Anthony said this to me. I was like, dude, you should be psyched if they give you an objection or like a pre-objection or an excuse right there because you can reframe them. It's like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So that's also another factor as well. So what do you think was the biggest thing that you did? Because I, I think so many people let the process just go through, you know, just kind of go through the movements of the call because they want to get to the close. Do you know what I mean? They're kind of afraid to bring up confrontation early in the call, right? And what you're saying there is kind of the exact opposite. You would search and you'd get excited for that confrontation at the beginning so you could kind of like nip it in the butt and change their perspective. Yeah, I mean, depending on how you look at it, right? So, and it's also contextual. If a prospect gave a, like, a little bit of concern in the beginning of the call, unless it's a major one, you want to slowly chipping away at it, right? Mm -hmm. So, if the prospect says in the beginning of the call, like, maybe in the first minute or so, they're like, yeah, I just do my research. Like, you don't want to go into, like, a hard reframe right away because most people are going to back off and shut down because it's too early. Because we got to realize, to these people, we're a complete stranger, they have their guard up. Like, is this person going to try to, like, do something weird? Like, trying to take advantage of me and, like, pitch me? So, they're trying to, like, fill the room a little bit. So, you don't want to go into a hard reframe right away. You want to slowly chipping away at it, right? As an example, if they say, if they're blaming, like, their, their wife or something. Yeah, it's my wife, da-da-da. Oh, it takes two to tango, right? But what are you doing now, too? Right? So, you know how that was in, like, a hard reframe, like, hey, man, have you considered? But it's, like, like slowly chipping away at it. And then as the call progresses, you can increase your assertiveness. So in music, there's a term called crescendo. So when I was younger, I played the violin, very Asian, I know. So I was a lead violinist in different <laughs> orchestras I was in. And so the crescendo, maybe you can put up on the screen somewhere, but like as time goes on, the, the volume of the note increases. Like, ah, right? So same thing with the assertiveness. It's not like you're going into the beginning of the call passive. I think a lot of people make that mistake as well because they hear from like any PQ, they mistake that as like, you know, they're being like too timid or they try to be mm. neutral, but they end up sounding passive and timid. That's one of the biggest things. And also another, you know, thing too is it's be- any call, but especially in up too, people want to be led. And so, but they want to be led by not by anyone, but someone they want to be led by. And so then the question is like who they want to be led by. Well, who would you want to be led by? Is someone probably speaks with conviction and certainty. Right, which is what Anthony talks about all the time is like like conviction, certainty, and confidence. And so because of that, I worked on that a lot as well. Right on the sales calls, I was like, okay, like I need to speak louder. 
a lot of people on, on the sales calls, I review quite a bit of sales calls and role plays. It sound it sounds very unconfident and passive. And because of that, in the mm -hmm. from the beginning of the call, you're already like shooting yourself in the foot. Right? So you're not going in like, you know, like oh like what's going you're not doing that because that's too try hard. But you're going like kind of casual. It's like, hey man, can you see me okay? Right? So like the casual but still laid back in confidence. Right? Mm. It's almost like having that swagger as as vague and broad as it sounds. So, but it goes back to human psychology too, by the way, having a swagger. So having swagger is like almost you seem nonchalant. It almost looks like you don't have a single problem in your world, in your life. And so even though you may have two million fires you're trying to put out, right? Because you're not you're not going like stressed out, like, hey, can you can you hear see me okay? Like, hey, can you see me okay? What that does is it sub communicates to the other person, the prospect that oh, is a high status person because they don't have a single worry in the world. Now, they're not logically consciously thinking this most of the time. Most of the time, it's a subconscious thing, right? You know the iceberg meme, right? There's like the tip of the iceberg and like below, like you don't see. Like subconscious yeah. is that. Like they're not logical thinking this, but like that's what's going on inside their emotions and their, and their nervous system, right? So you do that, slowly chipping away at it. And then later on as the call progresses, after you uncover pain, which is very important, also another thing that most closers don't do in the industry, is they breathe past, they breathe past problem the pain section is very surface layer right and so and i'm not saying like the way i'm talking about is the only way there's different ways of making sales and making good money in sales right i'm just saying this is how i i do it and this is how i found like is is it works to a certain degree right and so, how would you pull out the pain like how would you dive into that and be able to get a strong cost of an action uh yeah i mean it starts from the top of the call right to get the pain so you first go on is like hey liam can you see me okay we're gonna do a quick yeah i can hear you Go, hey, go for it. The call about possibly starting an online business to make more money. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, man. Just trying to make some more money. Okay, cool. You gave me one right there, right? So he's like, okay, overarching outcome, make more money. And then I'd go into, well, what are you doing for a living now? And then you say whatever, right? We can go back to the role play, right? So what are you doing for a living now? Uh, man, I'm just working in construction. Okay, you like it? Uh, not really. Okay. <laughs> what don't you like about it? Uh, it's really hard on the body. Really okay, hard on the body. Way. Um, just grinding, you know what I mean? I work 12 hour okay. shifts, uh, sore back. Yeah. Okay. So the sore back, how is it kind of like showing up in your day to day? Ah, uh, man. It just means like when I, I don't want to get up in the work. I don't want to get really? up in the morning to go to work. Mm. Yeah. How, how do you feel about that? Well, I don't like it. I don't like yeah. it. I mean, it makes work suck even more, I guess. That makes sense. How long have you feeling this way? Mm, probably the last like year. That's quite a bit. Now pause there. So that's how you uncover the pain. Like, that was a very easy example. There's like vague prospect. They give you like, eh, I just want to make more money. Ah, you know, I just saw the ad. There's different things you can do in that case. But that was one example. It's like, okay, cool. So problem, how's affecting them, how long, so on and so forth, right? So that's the first five minutes. And then later on, what you do is you, you feature pace to goal, the desired situation, right? So after they solve the problem, how life looked different, right? Then making the 10K a month or whatever, what would that do for them? What do they actually want? Not a want, but almost a need, a very strong desire. And how does it look like, right? So them not being able to like worry about their sore back, right? Them being able to come home one day is like, hey, honey, like, you know, the, the bent leaf I always wanted, go outside, I got it for you. How does it make you feel, man, being that husband, being the provider, being the leader of the household? Yeah, they feel great, right? And then you go into... But, but, but man, what happens if you don't do anything about this? You, you keep having this sore back. You keep being stressed out and your wife ends up resenting you. What happens then? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So that's how you like add the urgency. Well, that's how I do it, right? So it's, it, it all stacks on top of one another. Hmm. And, and it's almost like in a lot of ways, right? Like you, you show them that beautiful lifestyle, right? You get them feeling good and then you almost take it away. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, I didn't come up with this, by the way. Like, I just give credits where it's due, right? Like, so obviously, Jeremy, the NEPQ, like, I learned from Matt, Anthony, like, a bunch of different people. It's just my interpretation of it. But yeah, so it's you, you feature pace out the desired situation, like, okay, like, how would be different? And then you'd ask another question there, right? So with the, the, the current, well, depending on the offer, but like, okay, with the current skills you have now, how close are you to be able to come home one day and tell your wife that you got the Bentley? Not close at all. So what happens if you don't? And da 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 da. So what you do is, okay, you, you build that dream situation, and then after that, you bring it back to reality. 
with the current skills you have with XYZ now, how close are you to getting that outcome? And then you go into the consequence. Because what I found, like maybe someone's watching this, they'll resonate with this. You try to ask the prospects, like, hey, what happens if you don't? And the prospect fights back, like, that's not an option. That's never going to happen, right? So there's different reasons for it, but it can still happen. But you can reduce a lot of that by bringing back to reality, right? Because if you try to go from desire to consequence right away, it's a bit too abrupt. It's like this amazing, <laughs> you know, amazing life. And then you try to take it away to the, the dark, dark hell. They're like, no, they're trying to fight it. But you bring back to reality to the, the ground, right? It's like, okay, so what, what you have now? How close are you? They're like, not close at all. And then what happens if you don't, right? And then after that, if they still give you like, that's not going to happen, then you challenge them on that, right? I think most people are too afraid of doing that, you know? It's not about like trying to fight them or being combative. It's like helping them see reality. So if they say like, oh, that's never going to happen. Oh, brother, you have for the last six months. You can't why, do you think, why do you think sales reps are afraid to do that? Uh, very good question. I think there's different reasons for it. Number one is... They don't know how to do it, which is the logical answer. But number two, I think what's more important is that they're afraid of being in quote unquote confrontation or making the other person upset or having the other person lash out on them or whatever. I think that's a bigger one because if you don't know the how, but if you if you know like you should do it, then even if the execution is not perfect, like you still do something, right? Yeah. You'll just speak what's on your mind. Like you always try something. But I think a lot of people don't even try because of that. They're afraid of quote unquote re- rejection. It's almost like when you see a, you know, like a cute girl outside, like sitting down in a cafe or whatever, but you're afraid of going talking to her because, like, oh, what if she says no to me? It, it's the same. It's, it's social conditioning, right? So it's something I learned when I was going through like the dating phases. You know, a lot of times it comes from like our upbringing, right? Because. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe your teacher says like, oh, that's bad. Your parents says like, no, that's bad. That's wrong, right? And also in school, that if you get an answer wrong on the test, bad, bad, bad. Only this answer is the right one. Other ones are wrong. It's like, oh, shit. So that's a part of it, right? There's different reasons for it, you know? But Or maybe in the past experience, a lot of times the way human beings, us, we make decisions is from past experiences, right? And so maybe sure. in the past experience, maybe they said something. But maybe they got the other person upset, so they have a negative emotion attached to that. So that could be a part of the reason. And what's the solution to that? Well, I mean, the unsexy answer is just going for it. And then, you know, it's like just diving in. You know, when I was, uh, I lived in upstate New York in America for a little bit. And it's one of those towns, it's a village essentially almost. So there's like maybe three stoplights. There's people go to Walmart for entertainment, it's those kind of places. And so. <laughs> But during the summertime, people do something called bridge jumping. So what bridge jumping is, is you go on the edge of the bridge. It's not that high, but you go the jump to the water, right? So that was our form of entertainment. And so one day, me and my friend biked there for like an hour. It's like, oh, it's going to be so fun. And then we get to the, and then, okay, cool. So we get to the edge of the bridge. All we need to do is jump into the water. It's not even that high, right? Uh, And then we're just like looking at each other. It's like, yeah, so let's jump in. And we're not doing that. And then we kept like, it's been like 20 minutes. We're like, let's jump in. We're not jumping in uh, until one of our other friends like drove by. He's like, hey, what are you guys doing? He's like, just jump in. He's like, yeah, but I don't know, man. It's like, okay. She just like pushed, pushed us and then we just like jumped in. I was like, oh, that wasn't too bad. He's like, oh, the water's not even that cold. It's not that deep. I was like, oh, let's do it again. Now it became fun, right? It's one of those things like you just do it. So the how helps, you know, it's like. You got to understand the why behind the how also, right? Because it's helping them. So why would I say, I mean, brother, you have for the last six months. You okay with me saying that? So it's like, <laughs> if because at this point, you would have understood how long they've had the problem for and how long they've been in research mode or procrastinating for, right? Sure. So that's never going to happen. It's like, oh, brother, like you have for the last six months. So you're showing them reality, right? Because them saying like, that's never going to happen. That's, that's an easy way out for them because they're justifying to themselves that they're not to feel better about themselves while their life doesn't change. And so you just, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. You, that's never going to happen to you. You're not doing them a favor because their mm-hmm. life's going to stay the same and they're going to keep having the same problems, right? And so your job as a sales professional is like help them, okay, you know, it's not your responsibility to change your life, but help them get into the best position to get the outcome as much as possible, right? So like, oh, but you okay with saying that? And also perceived intention matters. So a lot of times people talk about intention in sales, right? 
your intention is to help the other person. But if the prospect doesn't see that, it doesn't matter at all. And I do mean that. And, yeah. I, and I, how I knew this is because when I was on 7th, obviously my intention was to help each prospect. But I kept seeing prospects shutting down on me, like giving me vague answers. And I even have prospects tell me, well, brother, you just seem dis- disinterested. I was like, really? I'm not disinterested. But my face and my tone showed that. Because, <laughs> like, I have, you know, you know, there's a running joke now. I have KBF, right? Which is pretty <laughs> big face. So I don't have that much expression in my face. It's a lot better now. Back to the even even worse. Because, number one, in, in Korea, we don't do the smiling at strangers thing that Americans do. It's like, how are you? We don't do that. And so... And especially growing up, my father has the least expression ever. I think I've seen him smile maybe four times in my entire life. Four times. And so (laughs) it's not like he's a bad person. It's just that that is his upbringing, right? And also in our previous generations in Korea, we have a saying, which is if a man smiles too much or if a man talks too much, then he's not a man, right? So Eastern Europeans have also had this as well because for whatever reason, I had a bunch of like Romanian sales reps coming to our training program. So I'm like, ah, like they have the same thing. So like, I gotta, we gotta fix that, right? So going back to perceived intention, your tonality, your facial expression, your body language, your overall vibe, as corny as it sounds, the prospect needs to see that your intention is trying to help them. They Mm -hmm. gotta see that because that speaks volume a lot louder than words, right? So how do you do that? It's like, oh, brother, I mean, you have so far. If you do that, then they're going to be like, what the fuck? Like, this guy's making fun of me. It's like, well, brother, you have for the last six months. You okay with me saying that? That's more like that tough love kind of subcommunication, right? So that nonverbal, mm-hmm. like, well, brother, you have so far. That subcommunicates to them. It's like, oh, that's their intention. You can also say it too. Like in the beginning as a training, all this helps. Dude, I'm, I'm only saying this. And I'm just saying this because I want you to fix this. You can say stuff like that. But you got to mean it, obviously, right? It's like... Dude, I know it sounds hard, but I'm just saying this because I want you to fix this. It's like, yeah, 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 you're right. And and then that's when people start to open up and take their guard down more. Well, because I guess it's getting them from, I mean, the classic thing, right? It's getting them from the other side of the table to get them to feel like you're both on the same side of the table, right? It's not you versus the prospect. It's now how can we figure this out together? Exactly. Now, Brian, I mean, when you came in, right, you, you went through... The account was seventh. I was sniper, sales sniper, and then you got poached over to sell for seventh level itself. What did that feel like to like come over to the the mothership, if you will, oh, <laughs> the the main yeah. offer? That was that was crazy. So what happened with the bizop offer was I was on that for like a couple of months, and uh, Marco and Anthony, uh, Anthony showed me a text like, "Hey Brian, uh, you're gonna start selling on seventh level." I was like, "Yo, it's crazy." <laughs> What the fuck? It's like it was like a bigger moment because I remember going to Sniper uh, on the the first day. There was like on the group training call on Zoom. I see all these people that almost like it, I see Yash at the time. I think he was like seventeen. This seventeen year old kid that's like he doesn't look seventeen. Love you, Yash, but Jesus. Uh, so he doesn't look seventeen, but he's a savage, right? So I've seen him on Jeremy's interview. There's Tony Haddad. I've seen him. There's Dan Van. There's Will Odoms, the guy that's crushing on Sirhan. And I see all these people, and I was like, dude, that's crazy. I literally felt like I was in Disneyland. And I told Anthony, too. I was like, dude, this feels like I'm in Disneyland. And the first day, Matt's like, okay, Brian Choi, role play with Yash. Like, oh, shit. And Yash was playing like a super A type, like, dude, just like, get to up with that kind of thing. I was like, dude, I can't believe I just role play with Yash. That's crazy. And there was like Dan Van, all these people. There's Anthony, there's Mark. Wow. It felt like that. And then going to seventh was, oh, dude, game time. Hand me the fucking controller. I literally felt like that because I was like, dude, just give me that. Salespeople, give me that, right? Because like I sold that program. I was like, oh, this is going to be so fun. So I go in. I think on the first week, I asked for like 30 referrals. Uh, <laughs> maybe more than that. Because I was asking like, because I already knew salespeople. So I was like, dude, who do you got? Who do you got? How do you got? Who do you got? I'm on seventh level now, bitches. So, <laughs> and then it was like, wow, it was so fun. And then uh, I got on the, the calls and then like, dude, like, I'm talking to salespeople and like selling sales training to salespeople. It's like, this is fun. I was like, and I can like, you can point out, like you can break the fourth wall. And it's like, yeah, I don't know. I got to think about it. Think about it. You get that from your mm-hmm. prospects? You're giving me an objection right now? You can do that stuff. And also what I started learning from Matt too is like, you can, br- you can 
in real time, you can break down what you're doing to them, right? So if I'm like pre-handling the objection after I go through the reframe, it's like, you see what, what I did there? They're like, what? Ah, oh, shit, you just pre-handled my objection, didn't you? Yeah, exactly. You want to learn how to do that? It's like, yeah. Well, we'll talk about it in a bit. But let's say we're talking, you know, I'll do that. It's like, that was like kind of funny, you know? So that was great. And then uh, I think uh, off the bat, I got to number two on seven, which is like, which is kind of crazy. Uh, I never became number one. I've had like, I think weeks where I was number one, but I never had like a, a single month or like year where I was number one. And there's, and then in a lot of respect to Yash, Yash is a fucking workhorse. Like he's very good with the skill set and he's a psych. I mean, he he made a reel on his Instagram the other day, which is like the best salespeople are psychopaths. And I was like, mm. I mean, no true words have been spoken, you know. And it's to what degree? Because I think I'm, I'm too, like, you know, I'm too degree. Like I'm, I'm I'm a bit psycho to other people's eyes. But Yash is true. a different level of psycho, and I say that in the best way possible because that's what he wants. And then props to him. But yeah, it was, it was like super fun. It was a, uh, it was very very fun. And you were how long were you at seventh level for? I think one and a half years. What what made you want to move on? What made you want to take yeah. that next step? Good question. So I never sold in normal time zone for that long. The only times mm. was when I was selling the, uh, the, the Aussie offer because I was in Korea. That lasted about one or two months. And then I was in Colombia for about like two, three months <clears throat> to get, just to get into the U.S. time zone. But I wasn't a huge fan of Colombia. Nothing wrong with it. It's just now it's not my top of not not top of sea. But I I was selling from Korea, waking up at three in the morning, or I'll be in Europe, which is it was better. But I was working from like let's say like three p.m. to like midnight or like eleven p.m. So I had no mm-hmm. social life. You know, like I had no life. And then I moved to Dubai, and there's a whole backstory behind that. But I moved to Dubai. I'm like, dude, okay, like, dude, this is I, I'm still in Dubai, by the way. Like, dude, I love this place. But the time zone is, I think, 4 p.m. Dubai time is like 8 a.m. Eastern or like 7 a.m. Eastern. So I started like 4 or 5 p.m. going until 1, 2, 2 a.m. in the morning. And because I was doing that, around like 10, 11 p.m., I would start to feel my eyes getting drier. I was like, I was like doing this, the sales call. It was getting drier. I'm like, about to, I'm about to go to fucking bed, right? My body's telling me, dude, go to bed. I'm just like... Well, do you like? You know, I'm doing that right on the sales call right now. <laughs> and trying to objection handle these salespeople. Dude, I'm not gonna pay money for sales training. I was like, dude, I was objection handling those people. You know what I mean? So yeah. And then I was doing that every day, which is fine. Like it's the it's the game. It's just the time zone and like, at, I was doing that for for quite a bit. But before even I left seventh level for the for for good, I even told Jeremy and Matt that I was leaving. Right, even a year before, I was in Europe at that time. Because at that time, I thought I was gonna end up living in Europe, get like a European citizenship or whatever. Because I like Europe, but the time zone is like okay, like from like three p.m. to midnight. Like I don't have a life, and I'm over here in Europe. I'm just in my room, like doing nothing, right? So, and I'm willing to do that for periods of time, just not all year long. Which is why Yash is able to become number one for that, and his skill set's great, amazing. It's just that I was never able to get to number one because of that, and I was, I was. I had to come to terms with it, which I did. But okay, so like, dude, I want to go out and like, <laughs> like I'm in Europe. Like, what am I doing here, right? So I'm like, eventually, at one point, I was like, I told Jeremy, hey, Jeremy, I thought about this a lot. Like, I'm leaving, and Jeremy's like, what? You crazy? You know? And then he, we're changing our comp plan, our commission structure next year. And then you know, and then he's like, the thing about Jeremy is, here's the thing. Everyone knows Jeremy's good at sales. Obviously, no shit, Sherlock. But when he <laughs> actually tries to sell you, it's a different story. Because this was a sale, right? So in the Slack channel, he wasn't even on a call with me. He was just sending me these voice notes on Slack. I was like, he's like, bro, look, we're gonna have our account executives, like we're gonna be starting on B2B, like higher package, higher price packages, and our, our reps are gonna be making four hundred K a year, uh five hundred K, some even a millionaire. I know that for a fact. He was doing that. I was like, fuck. Damn. So what is that like desired outcome, right? I was like, damn. I was like, and he was, and then also what he did was he's, he consequenced me. Well, Brian, because I was like, well, Brian, what are you going to do? I was like, well, maybe start a business. He's like, well, Brian, you know what happens when people try to start a business? He's like, yeah, I know like nine other people fail, whatever, but I still want to give it a shot. So, oh, let me tell you a story, Brian. And then he was telling me like these like scenarios, like seeding doubt is like different scenarios of people that start businesses and like not making enough money, like going broke or whatever. And so 
I was like, hmm, I'm having more doubt now. I was like, yeah, but Jeremy, like, I just want to, like, maybe I need to go out and fail and, like, figure this out. And Jeremy sent me a voice and I was like, well, Brian, why fail if you don't have to? Oh, the verbal <laughs> pause, though. God damn. The verbal pause, though. It got me. I was like, hmm. I was like, okay, I'm listening. I said, well, listen. Can I make a suggestion? I was like, sure. Well, what if you stay for maybe a year longer at least? And then maybe you can learn more skill set. You can, you know, potentially earn more commissions. And after that, even if you still want to do it, like now you earn more more savings and more skill set to actually do your own thing. I'm paraphrasing here, so you know, just bear with sure. me. But doing that, and I was like, it almost feels like you're in a bind. And it almost feels like you're like this. Like you're in a bind, like you can't get out. You try to escape, but you can't. It literally feels like that, even over voice note. The golden handcuffs. It, 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 it's, it's the weirdest thing ever. And Matt's, I'm sure, I think Matt said this in, in your interview as well, that Jeremy's like very, very good at sales, right? So very. I'm like, like we see him in the videos. And so it's funny when some people comment on his Instagram, really like, oh, this would never work on me. Yeah, you say that now. Logically. That's your logic speaking. <laughs> just, just wait until you get in a fucking call with him. If he has the time, right? So it's like, ah, oh, man, I gotta stay. So it's it's crazy what he can do. So I, was, I stayed for another year. So I grinded out. I moved to Dubai, four p.m. to like two a.m. I had like no life. Um, but I'm like, yeah, let me just try to still get better at this. It wasn't even about the money at the time because like, you know, like I wasn't. My apartment was quite expensive, and then Dubai is obviously very expensive. But you know, I, I still had like decent amount of like money I'm like saving and stuff like that. So it wasn't about the money, but I was like, okay, well, let me just, I want to be the best. My whole purpose of existence last year in 2023 was to be number one in seventh level and beat Yash. That was just my whole purpose. It wasn't to make more money. It wasn't to make an impact. It wasn't to like help my friends or family. It was just that. And don't get me wrong. Like I helped my friends and family with the money, so on and so forth. But I was like, that was the number one driver. And I never did it, but I don't regret it because you know what? Like I went for it. It's the same thing, right? You know the island analogy that Matt talks about. I was like, mm, you know what? at least you at least course. went for it. You know what? You tell the prospects, at least you went for it, even if you fail. And looking back at it now, that's exactly how I think about it. It's like, yeah, like at least I went for it. Yeah, I didn't become number one. It's like, yeah, I fucking went for it. And then these people had way more sales experience than me, dude. They had like two, three, five, some ten more years of sales experience than me. And it was just like, man, I can't. It was great just like competing against these guys. It's a friendly competition, right? So competing against these guys and it was uh it was fun. But but yeah, but going back to your thing, it's like it, it came to one point I was like I felt like so miserable at one point mm. working from like four PM to one two AM and like just keep doing this on my sales calls like I was like, dude, I wanna go to fucking bed. And then there were times as well where like I would have like eight calls booked, six showed up because I was very good at getting people to show up at that time. But sure. like I have days where I, I made zero sales, you know, mm. so because like sales is not like a linear thing, right? It's not like you're consistent, like five sales a day. Da, 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 da. And so I had days, but I'm like, damn, like I, I, I can't go to bed right now because I remember Alex Hermosi was uh, talking about one of his videos that he he had like the best salespeople he knew, like door knockers. They, they did not go home until they sold like two pest control or solar, right? So, of like, so they're like, Alex Hermosi is saying like, those are psychopaths. Like they have to sell two a day. After they sell one, they're like one, 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 one. And then move on to the next house. Like psychos, like one, 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 two, 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 two. They'll do that. I was like, okay, let me do that. So I would <laughs> one time or well, a few days, I'd stay up until three, four in the morning. It's like, I'm not going to bed until I close a deal. And so I would send out like text blasts. I would like dial, like put them on a power dialer, upsell, out, but nothing's working until eventually like one time, like I upsell the dude to like an 8K or 12K thing. And then I, I put him through, he gave me objections. I was like, ah, I'm not going to bed until you close. I'm not saying <laughs> that, but I was like in my mind, I was like, ah. And then I, I upsell the guy for like 12K. I put through the sales form and then I put in the Slack channel I told myself I wouldn't go to bed until I close the deal, and this is it. I'm going to bed. And then I had that. I wish I would have screenshotted it, but I had that, and then I was like, yeah. like It wasn't even like so excited. I was like, I did it. I, uh, I said I was going to do it. I did it. And then that was great. It's just not that sustainable because you wake up the yeah. next morning feeling like shit. You know, It's like, oh, my God. So you know, it eventually got to a point where it became like March or April this year. I was like, man. Uh, and then also another thing too, like there's, 
I felt like because like if I was in the office, maybe I would have stayed longer. Not just because of time zone, but because it's like sticky, right? There's more reasons to stick around. But because I was remote, there's another reason too. Because if I was in the office, there's Jeremy, there's Josh, there's other people, right? And uh, also another thing too is if you were in Scottsdale, you have a big advantage. Because what you can do is they do the in-person events and you can do back of the room sale. But I saw mm -hmm. people that I was farming, but they would go to the in-person events. I would, I'd sell them the tickets to go to the in-person events. But... The people, the reps are at the in-person events. They go to the back of the room. Like, they're cashiers. They're not salespeople at that point. They're cashiers. Like, yep, car detail, da 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 16K, 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 right? And so, obviously, they have some objections. But I'm like, I saw in the socks, and I'm like, fuck, I, I was farming that person. And I was trying to call them, too. They don't answer, obviously. It's like, no. <laughs> right? It's like that uh, it's like that boyfriend, but, like, the girl's, like, in, in bed with, like, somebody else. It's like, no. Right? So, I was like, damn. I mean... Nothing I can say about it at that point because obviously, you know, the rep's job is to sell them, obviously, right? In the back of the room. So like, of course. It's like, damn. But I couldn't go to America at that time because of my visa situation. Is I'm not in the office. I probably can't be in the office for legally because I'm not an American citizen, right? So uh, more and more, like those things piling up, nothing against it. And another sure. thing is, um, and I, I told this to Jeremy and like other people too, but I'm just not a fan of corporate. I'm just how it is. Mm. So... Uh, corporate meaning that so you know in the office and like they have these corporate structures and how jeremy tried to reframe me was okay well but corporate has more stability and he's absolutely right because if you have if you have a seventh level you probably don't have to offer hop because seventh level is more stable because there's a corporate structure right not companies like that that's great it's just yeah i mean like the, the reason why i got into like the online space in the first place because i hate the corporate stuff you know mm -hmm. like it, like and because I've seen corporate in Korea, I've seen the like corporate America. So I'm like, that's the last thing I want. So I don't want corporate, right? And then they were more encouraging more and more people to come to the office. I know what they're doing, right? So they're like incentivizing people that are coming to the office tangibly and non-tangibly. And then the more I felt like kind of distance around that, it's like, hmm, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll get out. And it's not like I'll get out to do sales training. Sales training was the last thing I wanted to do. I told myself I'm not going to do fucking sales coaching. But <laughs> here we are. Here we are. Here we are. And, and and it was kind of interesting, right? Because you came into the scene and it, and really, you, you almost became that household name. I, I talked to a lot of different closers. I talked to a lot of different people that are wanting to get into the space. And it's like, oh, yeah, I know. I know Brian Choi. Yeah, June Choi. Yeah, yeah. Like your two names have been so interconnected um, in the space. What, what do you think you were able to do to do that? Because genuinely, you came in. And yes, you had been selling for years, but like you said, you kind of were doing it in the background. You weren't really posting your results a heap. Like you knew sales reps because you sold to sales reps, but it kind of seemed like you started the podcast one day and holy shit, you're across everyone's feed the next day. What do you think you were able to do to do that? Yeah, I mean, it's just funny because um, like I was in Sydney uh, maybe two months ago to do a in-person thing with uh, people in my training group. And, uh, and also I got invited to like the sales event thing and, um, shout out to Riley and Thomas for the invitation. So I was there and then like, I had like a bunch of people come up. It's like, Oh, Brian, I seen your podcast. I was like, Oh, okay, cool. Like, I didn't even know like people are watching that. Like I see the views obviously, but like the view is like this number on a screen, right? I was like, okay, like you got like this many views, but when you see an actual human being come up, can I take a photo with you? I'm like, yeah, sure. I look like shit, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like so <laughs> awkward with photos. I was like, yeah, I'm doing that, you know? So that was like, oh, this is this is cool, you know. And then because I'd get messages, but again, messages are cool, but it's also like a virtual. It's not it doesn't like hit home that much, right? Uh, and then there's another guy in my in my training group, and he said, yeah, I was in Bali at a sales mastermind, and like like ninety percent of the people were you know they talking about you, they need your name and stuff like that. I was like, oh, that's 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 kind of cool. How I was, I didn't even know, you know, that was kind of going on. But how I was able to, I don't know. I. I I really don't because it's not like like you're saying, it's not like I was like documenting my journey or stuff like that when I was a sales rep. You know, the the only time I would post is in the sales revolution group, and I'd make like I'd do Facebook lives when Jeremy wasn't posting. But the purpose of that was to get leads, and nurture leads. Like the, that was the only purpose, so I can make more commissions. Like that was the only reason. It wasn't to like grow my personal brand. It wasn't to like do sales training one day. It's like, well, let me make more sales. Like that was the only reason. Uh, but obviously I got kicked out of the sales revolution group. I didn't do anything, but they just kicked me out, which, uh, I, I get it, but it's all good. But yeah, I mean, then, uh, 
one day I was talking to June. June came to Dubai. I did nine months of objection handling for this man to come to Dubai. Uh, <laughs> he was in Korea and like Europe and some God knows where. I think Mexico. And there's like, you know that scene in Wolf of Wall Street? It's like, the reason for the call today, John, is someone just came across my desk, John. It's the best opportunity. If you have 60 seconds, I can share that with you. Got him? You know that scene? Yeah, so of course. It was like me picking up my Dubai every time, calling my June. June, you need to come to Dubai. Bro, you need to come to Dubai. Dubai, promised land. And I was doing that for nine months. So imagine, right? But June was like, yeah, I don't know, man. Da, da, da. Nine months, finally got here. And then we're just hanging out. And the thing is, I've known June for, I think, about like four years now at this point. Hmm. Maybe longer, four or five years. Every time we talk, it's about like sales. It's, it's, it's always about sales. And so even when he was in Dubai, like we were always talking, like, yapping about sales, 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 right? And we kept joking, like, hey, one point we should do a podcast because like, that's all we talk about. And then we talked about it, like We brought up the idea a few times, but we never did it. But when he got it in person, it's like, I mean, dude, there's a studio in Dubai. It's called Dubai Podcast Studio. Shout out to Dubai Podcast Studio. They're, uh, they're great. Uh, but yeah, like all the people you see online uh, that are in Dubai, like they shoot their podcast there, right? So and I was like, dude, I think it'll be cool. Like the setup looked nice. Like let's just do for fun. And so we just did it for fun. That's really, yeah. I was like, I mean, we talk about it anyway. Might as well, like, maybe some people see it. And so it's like the classic thing where, like, maybe we get 50 views on it. And then we, we just, like, got in the studio. It's like, oh, it's cool. Like, lighting and, like, mics. It's like, and then we didn't even know what we were doing. Like, we didn't script it out. We're like, man, maybe we talk about this, you know. And then we didn't even know who was going to edit our videos. It was like, we we're talking about it. And then people were, like, commenting on it. It's like, oh, this is cool. Like, da, 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 da. And it wasn't even like sex to topics. It was on like fucking increasing show up rates. It's like no one wants, no sales rep cares about that, even if it's important. But, you know, so, but I, I think the reason why is because there wasn't like a sales podcast for our little industry in the high ticket space before. Because mm -hmm. there, you know, obviously Jeremy has his podcast, but it's for like all different industries. And I think it's also because maybe to people, he may not be that relatable, Jeremy. Right? Sure. There's different reasons for that. My guess would be, number one is the age gap. Because Jeremy is, I think in his, I could be wrong, like in his 40s or 50s. But a lot of people that are coming into like the high ticket world are younger, in their 20s, right? Early to like late 20s at best. But the, the, the main people that Jeremy targets is people that are in like insurance, solar, SaaS, like those boring tr traditional businesses, but there's more money in those businesses, in those industries. But, and also those people are a lot older. They're in their like 30s, 40s, sometimes 50s and 60s. And it's also, you know, like how you talk, you resonate with different people, right? Even if it's, you know, like somebody makes more money, but okay, this person, like the, the way they talk, the way they look, the, the stuff they're talking about. Maybe you resonate more with them, right? So, like, because Jun and I are, like, you know, 28, right? At the time, like, 27, 28. And people in our space, maybe, like, early 20s, mid-20s, late 20s. So, maybe they feel more resonant with it. And we're talking about very specific things on, like, things people can relate about, right? You know? So, and something that's only going in the high-ticket world. And I think that's why people gravitate more towards it. But, I mean, who knows? No, I'd agree with you. I think it, it it almost felt like, well, people love reality TV, right? In a lot yep. of ways, because it, it's everyday people, <laughs> everyday people, but it's everyday people that they get to relate to. And I think when you guys launched your podcast, it, it gave an insight into what it was like to be other closers. You know what I mean? Because so many closers are, are closed off. You know, that story you tell about sitting in your room, grinding out 10, 12 hours, going maybe out to the gym and back. Well, I think that's the reality for a lot of people in the space. So when they got a, a glimpse into you guys, it was like, oh, shit, <laughs> there's someone talking that's actually going through what I've gone through. And they were able to relate a whole lot more. Yeah, could be it. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes we feel a bit isolated, right? Because we sell remote. And I mean, I can speak for myself. Like I'm in my four walls inside of the four walls. And you're just like taking sales calls all day. And like, you're not really like, yeah, like you have your friends on Facebook, like your sales homies. But it's like, you know, sure. it's just, you know, you kind of talk and stuff like that. But you see, oh, like there's these other guys that are talking about what's being behind the scenes. It's kind of like, um, you know, these days, uh, you know, the NBA, the yeah. like basketball, right? So of course. lately, 
like retired NBA players or like current players during the off season, they started doing podcasts. And there's something I'm realizing after we did our podcast, but because I watch basketball, I was like, oh shit, Kevin Garnett's doing podcasts. Kevin Garnett's hilarious, by the way. Uh, but like Kevin Garnett's doing the podcast and they're talking about stuff that was going on when they were playing, right? Yeah, so when I was like going against Dwight Howard, like this is what I was doing and like he was trash talking, so I was doing it. like, yo, I, I was pretty cool. So number one, it gives you an insight of behind the scenes. Like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like I, you know, because you only see them playing basketball, right? Maybe like post game interviews, that's pretty much it. And also they're talking, like breaking down uh, Tracy McGrady, uh, you know, he's like, he scored like 13 points in like 30 seconds and won the game, right? So he's breaking down like what he was doing in that move. Like, okay, the defender came here, so I did this. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And they're telling stories of like what happened, you know, like funny stories and stuff like that. So like, oh, like that's, it makes them more relatable, like makes them look like a human. It's like, oh, like I, that was actually pretty insightful. Even though like, I don't like, I don't play basketball myself, but I'm like, that's pretty interesting. So maybe it was like similar thing to that, right? People seeing like, oh, like, so that's what was happening. Oh, that's what's going on. I mean, some things they can relate, you know? Mm. No, I, I fully agree. And I, I guess now, like, what what is the goal? What you, you talked about earlier, how a big thing for you is you always had a goal. You always had something that you were driving towards, right? What is it now? What What is driving Brian Choi? Yeah, I mean, there's a hedonistic stuff and there's the other stuff. So the hedonistic stuff is, like, okay, like, make more money, right? So uh, with our with the sales training I was doing, like I started with low ticket because I, I never wanted to, I never thought it would be like, I would put that much effort into it. Uh, so, you know, I started like 97 a month and like 147 a month, whatever. Right. So, but what I started kept getting from people was that, dude, this is better than the 12 K I spent on this program. Dude, this is better than the 15 K I spent on this program. Dude, I fucking regret spending 15 K on this program because like, I could have done yours. I damn, like I had to like enough of those instances. I was like, Hmm interesting and the thing with low ticket is like, like people are just not going to put in that much effort and time into it as much of a high ticket they can try as much as possible i'll put in more effort into it it's just impossible because like subconsciously psychologically it's just impossible because like subconsciously you know back of your mind you only spend 97 bucks a month right like 147 bucks a month but even with that like there are people that came in like they're making six grand a month and they post in the welcome but it's like, hey guys my name is so and so i'm making 6k a month i want to get to 10k a month by the end of the year they post it in September, end of October, they post, hey guys, I made 14K. And then I spent my money, my mom spending money for the first time. Bro, I was like, and, the, and I, those people and their people that went from, you know, make it, make like 5K a month extra, they doubled their commissions, they doubled their close rate, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, mm, okay, maybe I should put more effort into it, even though I have been. So these days, what I'm working on is I'm shutting down the low ticket. And uh, I'm actually going to the high ticket stuff, right? So I'm actually like putting an actual like implementation stuff. Cause I think one of the biggest reasons why people take sales trainings and they don't get the results is Jenny and I were talking about the podcast yesterday. There's different reasons for it. One is internal, one is external, right? So some are mm -hmm. like in the client themselves. Maybe they're not putting in the work. The obvious reasons that we may all think of, they're not putting in the work, they're not putting in the time, yada, yada, yada. There's the external, which is, from the program standpoint, like the flaws I'm seeing, because at this point I spend maybe over 250K USD in coaching programs, courses, one-on-one -on -one consulting, masterminds, all that kind of stuff. And then one thing I'm, like a common pattern I'm seeing is that most in the programs I've sold, the, the a lot of programs, doesn't matter what the guru, the influencer says, success rate in our world is just low. It's just incredibly. It's, is like the doesn't and the, the gurus will say the influencers say it's like oh the success rate maybe I'm one of them right maybe I'm just not aware of that but it's just it's just low just because of the nature of the thing it's not a done for you thing there's less controllable variables that play into play right and so I'm like hmm okay but how can we like control as much as possible <clears throat> so that's what I've been studying even when I was a sales rep I was studying fulfillment. Like how to get clients better results. Even when I was a sales rep, it wasn't my job. I was I was technically not getting paid to do it. But the reason why I was doing it is number one is I can upsell those people and get more referrals. And that's how I was able like that's because like I I've won an award at, at seven for uh, most amount of back end revenue generated in a single month, right? So I was like top on that. Um, What'd you do? So, like upselling people, right? So upselling people. No, 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 no. I mean, how much did you do? How much did you do? Got to ask. In, in back end revenue, I don't think I did much. In back end revenue, I think maybe five to seven k a month in comms from back end revenue, within three to seven k a month from back ends, not including my front end and my follow ups. So it's still great. 
on the inverse, if I didn't do that, I would have lost out on like 60 grand a year, so on and so forth, right? If I didn't do that. And so, but there's the, the bread and butter that I want to help people with, right? So I call it pipeline closing, which is a fancy term that encompasses like follow-ups, upsells, renewals, and outbound referrals. And so my, my best case studies, my best students, they all do that, right? So they're going in and like they're closing from the pipeline. They're going in and like doing the upsells and the follow-ups. And I asked them, hey, if you hadn't done that, and if you just only relied on the, the inbound calls, how much money would you have lost? And they always say, let's say the rep got to like 14K a month, right? They say that I would have lost mm -hmm. 9K out of the 14K. And if a rep got to like 12K, how, did, how much would you have lost? They say, I would have lost 6K a month, like 72 grand a year, right? And so like these interviews are on my YouTube channel so you can see, and I have like more coming out. But, you know, so because getting, something Mad Rider says as well is getting better at sales takes time. And mm -hmm. being good at sales is hard. And it's something that no sales guru will ever say because obviously it's not beneficial for them, right? And that's fine. It's, it's I get it. Or maybe their truth is different because there's no such thing as the truth is only your truth, right? So there's different variations of the truth because for person number one, objection handling is the only way to make more money in sales. Person number two, mindset is the only way. Person number three, persuasion, tonality. Person number four, your activity, right? Everyone's different. It's just my version of the truth, like what I've done and what I've seen. And so, okay, so going back to that, okay, so how can we put people in the best position to actually hit their income goal? Because like getting better sales, sales takes time, right? Sure. You're not going to have beautiful tonality overnight. Like, dude, I took fucking acting classes. I hired pickup artists to work on my tonality. Not sales trainers, pickup artists to work on my tonality. <laughs> I'm being serious. There's a guy named Owen Cook. He runs a company called Real Social Dynamics. It used to be like a gangster, like a pickup coach, a pickup company. I called them like the Sam Evans of the pickup world, right? Because he was like the OZ in that space. And so yeah. and a phenomenal public speaker. One of the best public speakers I've ever seen. Him, Andrew Tate, probably the best public speakers I've ever seen. Andrew Tate, love it or hate him, what, whatever you decide to believe in, but you need to give to the guy. He's an amazing speaker, right? Regardless of Hands what down. he actually says. So him and Owen Cook, the best public speakers I've ever seen. And so I hired that guy uh, with him and his head coach. And so I worked on my tonality and my facial expression, right? And so like, it, but it took a lot of time. Like I didn't get it. Like I'm still working on that thing even to this now, right? And so I was like, okay, cool. And then getting better with objection handling, dude, like that also takes time. Because a combination of not only being able to memorize and knowing and understanding the process of objection handling, the tactical side, but also having the balls to actually say it. <laughs> That's another yeah. thing. That's another thing, right? Because you could have the perfect words. Like, I don't want to like loop it back to mindset and stuff like that. But it's like some people are just afraid to say it. And that takes time too. But I found that tonality is the most difficult thing to coach and take the longest time. Uh, so... So going back to why people, a lot of people don't succeed is now these days, because uh, there's one specific incidence where there was a student that came in and then, um, you know, he, he's like, hey, Brian, I need one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, cool. And I didn't even like, you know, it wasn't like a difficult sale. I was like, I think I spoke like five, 10 minutes. And, like he paid me like thousands, right? So, but I should have done a better job vetting that guy. Probably nothing wrong with him. It's just like my fault is like he, he has like other side, other stuff going on in his life, like personal stuff. Um, mm. Maybe that could be part of the reason why he has a very gloomy vibe to him. So he sounds almost like sad on his sales calls. So I like, I had to cheer him and say, hey man, like more upbeat, like talk from the front of your throat, you know, more casual, kind of like this. And I like drill him on it. I was like, yeah, Brian, but like he kept doing that. I was like, hmm. Eventually I got, and I talked to enough people to realize that, yeah, like it's, I, I don't, is it a sales? Cause like he has like stuff outside and you know, sales that's going on. It's like, oh, okay. So next time I should have said no. So that's like a learning lesson is like, if a closer has a like really bad tone these days, I would say no, or I would at least set the expectations. Like, Hey, just to let you know, I'm just saying this, like your tonality is like, it's kind of like this, like very timid. So it's going to take you longer. So if you still want to do this, like more than happy to help you out, but just know that, or I would say no, this is what I would do these days. You know, mm -hmm. uh, these days I turn around more people, you know, if they come from like, Hey, Brian, I need help with cold calling. I know the words, I know the scripting on cold calling, but I haven't done it myself. So I was like, Hey man, like I know what to do, but I haven't done it myself. So like, here's the other person I can refer you to. They're great. They crush it in cold calling. 
right? If there are setter coming in these days, I'm just like, yeah, like setters, like I don't really click. Because I realized setters, yeah, like there are people that came in and tripled their comms as a setter in my training group, right? But these days I wouldn't take them on because if you're closer, you're just going to get more out of it, you know? And so long story short, that's what I'm working on. It's an implementation program. And uh, I wouldn't even let people ask a question if it's not going back to their biggest constraint in their sales. So the biggest constraint in the sales, the, another big reason why people don't succeed in sales is because they're working on the wrong shit. Mm. Because they're, they're like, oh, I keep getting think about objections. I need to work on think about objections. Right? So they're doing that. I remember there was one incident. I was doing a group training call and then one person came out. I was like, hey, Brian, I, like, I keep getting like trust objections. Like, what should I say? Okay, out of 10 times you hop on a sales call, how many times does it happen? It's like one. Okay, so it doesn't keep happening, right? But okay, so what's the biggest objection you're losing the most commissions to? They're like, uh, think about objections. So why aren't you asking questions about how to overcome and prevent think about objections? It's like, oh, you're right. So that's why I give people a data tracker almost no one uses because it's almost like my mom when I was younger, Brian, eat your broccolis. Mom, I want the chicken nuggets, right? No, right? So it's like, track your data. Objection handling reframe, right? It's, it's one of those things, which is why, like, I have the least sexy marketing message in the history of sales training. <laughs> Track your data, call leads. <laughs> Increase your show. Like, like, no sales rep wants to hear that. They're like, objection handling reframe. Oh, and the analogy is so cool, right? But, I mean, this is just my truth, you know? So I was like, okay, cool. So in that case, because, and I also talk about, I'd rather prevent objections. Like, absolutely work on over overcoming objections absolutely this is a different thing about me is like i don't say like oh fuck prevention or fuck handling i say absolutely work on that however this is going to give you a bigger difference in your commissions so this is the different leverage you can pull so matt talked about it in your podcast like the discipline is you have 10 different problems you can solve you only focus on one at a time hmm. it's the same thing here there's a bunch of shit you can do to get better at sales or make more money in sales you identify your biggest constraints. And how do you know that? Number one, you got to track your data. Number one, you got to know what, how, to, how to look at it and what to do with it. Because a lot of people, they may track data, but they don't know what to do with it. And number two, on the, so that's on the data side of things. Right? On the skill set side of things, you got to have someone look at your sales call and like, identify what's wrong and what to do with it. Right? And actually tangibly train you. Uh, I've trained some sales teams, and I think like some of the business owners say, Brian, you're like, we've had a lot of like, big names come in, but you are really good at training. And I, I never, I'm like, I never thought about it, but I think that's because on my training calls, I don't do a lot of Q and A's. I also stop people from doing Q and A's. So if you have a question, it's like, like dude, asking the community, I'll like send you a Loom video or whatever, or like answer it. But on the call, I'm like, okay, what's your biggest constraint? Okay, let's go through that. Mm -hmm. Like I always have people, and it's not something people want to hear, right? It's very unsexy. It's like, but Brian, the objection handling reframe, dude, like, okay, dude, the trust objection reframe, dude, this is the biggest issue, right? So. It's not something one people want to hear, but it's from what I see, what they need to do, right? Which mm -hmm. is very like, like from a marketing standpoint, very unsexy, and like no one wants to hear that. Like eat your broccoli, but like, dude, I don't know what else. To do. So I try, I try my best to like, you know, the whole classic of like, you know, like you know, wrap the broccoli in bacon and all that kind of shit, right? So I try to do that, and okay, cool. So you're you're getting think about objection. You're losing the most sales from that. Okay, how to overcome it? Here's the classroom material. Here's the scripting for it. But let's talk about how you can prevent it. Because I'd rather not get in the first place, right? So how you can prevent it in the call itself. And before the sales call itself, you can, there's different ways you can prevent it, you know? And so we go, I'd rather prevent it from happening before the sales call. So we go through that and then we work our way backwards. Like that's what we do. Like the reps that I train, the results, they, they get the best results. Like they have, I haven't even taught them objection handling. Like at all. <laughs> like we don't, during our coaching calls, we don't work on objection handling. Like it's, it's, it's on the other stuff, right? like the, the, the activity stuff we're talking, the process. So what I'm working on, I'm, a, I'm going a long rant here, but uh, working on a high ticket implementation program, right? So I'm working on that. And I'm, you know, I'm talking a lot of theories here, but obviously I got to test it, like see what happens. So I'm sure. bringing like, like a limited amount of people. I know that's like a sales guy thing, like scarcity and kind of stuff, but like I just, I'm doing everything. So like, I can't, like I'll die if I like bring on more people. <laughs> So like limited amount of people, like implementation base, it's not going to be like me babysitting them because it's not about that either, but like very like strategic. So I'm working on that. And then, you know, hedonistic stuff, like, you know, like living up Dubai penthouse, you know, uh, 
and um, I don't know, like nice watches, stuff like that. That's the hedonistic stuff. Um, and, and, you know, but on like the broad, like the longer term goal is at one point, I do want to go back to Korea and do something about the suicide rate. And mm. not in a sense that I'm going to do like therapy for these people, but sure. a lot of that is social narrative and social conditioning. So in the education system. So that's something maybe I could do. Because the last thing I want is like talking to the depressed people all day, but showing sure. people that listen, like just because you got a bad test score doesn't mean your life is fucking over. There's other ways to make it in life. Like, look at me. I'm a proof of that. You know, like I, I didn't get into a good school. I dropped out of university after three semesters. You know, but I'm doing okay. Like I'm, I'm, I'm living right. So you can do that too, right? It's like, oh, you know. So, so that that'll be it. Like going back to like, okay going back into the crane market, doing something like that. It'll be a long-term thing though, because again, like sure. focusing on one at a time, but yeah, that's the goal. Oh, that's awesome. And I mean, a wee shout out to you, like me and you linked up, ooh, I don't even know, probably like six, six, seven months ago, something like that. Um, and, and I think when you talked there before of getting more value out of a hundred bucks in a month compared to a $10,000 program, you know, I, I came in, I, I watched it for a month and I, I jumped on the calls with you and I, I went through it and it was so, it was that value. You know what I mean? I think overnight I was in a wee bit of a, a slump at the time, but you like doubled my clothes, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it was doubled in the span of like two weeks and it was nothing sexy. It was nothing crazy. But it was exactly what you said. It was getting back to the fundamentals. Track your shit, first off, so you know what you're doing. And then the other thing that I really admired and I really liked, actually, um, this is a good shout out for you, is your decision trees of what to say. Because one thing that I found is so many people talk about like scripts and you know we can say whether you're, you're supposed to use scripts or not supposed to use scripts, whatever, I don't care. But if you use scripts, there's so much dialogue that's in between those sentences that no one talks about, right? But one thing what uh, happened when I came into your training was the dialogue in between, you have it broken down. You know what I mean? There's actual decision trees to take you through the whole step. So you're not just going from question A to question B when there's 10 subsects underneath and you're just like completely lost but you actually understand why you're asking each question to build into the next. Yeah, 100%. I think that's that's where I was getting lost in the sauce. And I think a lot of sales people get lost on sales calls because of that, or they move on where they maybe they're better off getting lost because they're just moving on without like getting the things they need to get, right? So, because in a sales script, it's like, okay, here's the question, next question, next question. But when was the last time a sales conversation when they exactly had the script written out? Dude, I can't remember. <laughs> it's never does. It, 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 never. I, I can't remember, bro. So it's like, okay, so that's why I was getting lost home. Like they're saying this. I'm like, I think it's too vague, but I don't know what to say. Or if they're saying this, I don't know if that's deep enough. Like, I, I don't know. Right. So I'm like, hmm. So I was going to call a uh, coaching call with Matt Ryder when I was on seventh. And uh, I was like, dude, like sometimes I get lost. I watch your oh, like, map out of the decision tree. I'm like, what's the decision tree? Well, you ever get in an argument with somebody and you go home, you're taking a shower, you're like, ah, I should have said this. Like, you know, same thing with a sales call, right? On a, on a sales call, you have a prospect, ah, I should have said this, right? So if you ever have that moment, it's like, okay, but why, why not just prepare that before the sales call? So if this, then that. If that, then this, All right? So depending on, because typically a common thing will happen in, from after each question, right? So as an example, if you ask, well, do you like the work you're doing? And then they could only give you two, maybe three different answers. Yes, I like it. No, I don't like it. Eh, yes and no. Right? So it's the three scenarios. If they say no, what don't you like? If they say yes, what do you like about it? And you can do two truths and uncover the problem. If they say yes and no, I'll start with the positive. What do you like about it? And then after you ask, well, is there anything to change about either the type of work you do or, I don't know, I guess the financial or time freedom you're getting from that, if you could? At that point, here's what people don't talk about. Usually one of two things happens. They give you a problem which is, yeah, I'm not making enough money, I'm working too much, or we're not getting enough leads. Or they give you an outcome-based answer. So outcome-based answer is, I'd like to make more money. I'd like to have more time freedom. I'd like to get better quality leads. But that's not a problem, right? Now, mm -hmm. why is it a problem if you don't get a problem? Because how Sam Bowman said this one time, value is created, because everyone talks about creating value, very value, right? Value is created by solving problems. 
And how problems are solved is, well, there needs to be a problem in the first place, right? And then so that's what businesses are for. Businesses provide value, and value is created by solving problems. So if there's no problem, why should this person need a solution? Right? So that's when you get like, I'll do it myself. Let me think about it. It costs too much, right? So they don't see the need for it. So if they say, you still need to uncover the problem, but you can't just say, oh, but bro, isn't it like frustrating? Oh, yeah, but isn't it like hard? Because they're going to shut down. They're going to like, they know what you're doing, right? So if they say, well, I'd like to get more leads. And let's say you're selling like some kind of business coaching where your your company, your program helps them get better quality leads. And let's say the business has been doing like Facebook ads, right? Well, bro, why not get mm-hmm. more leads for Facebook ads? Well, we can't. Why not? Oh, because we're capped out with the ad spend. What's that doing to the growth of the business? Well, we, we haven't. We've been stagnating for the last six months. You want to change that? Yeah. So it's like, okay, cool. So we took. So why not get outcome with ex- whatever you're doing now? That's a good question to, it's one of my go-tos because mm. like the question is like, it gives you with a higher probability that you're going to uncover the problem, right? Why not get an outcome of what you're doing now? Because if they could have, they would have done it, right? Like that's the whole point. Like, like why not, why not make more money with the job you have now? I can't, why not? My salary's capped. Like that's pretty much like, so whenever you ask a question, it's almost like being a good, uh, like a, I think a lawyer, right? So I was watching mm-hmm. a video, the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard case in court yeah and the lawyer attorney whatever you want to call that person she's a fucking savage she was drilling amber heard with like <laughs> okay but like what about this what do you think about this and amber heard's like uh uh like she was like uh you know like she couldn't like she was done she was cooked because why the the lawyer the attorney that person she already knew the answer and she knew that the answer was going to be beneficial to their case and so being a good salesperson is a pretty much the same thing. You already know the answer. You don't know exactly what they're going to say, but you know what type of answers they're going to give you with a high probability. Mm-hmm. And you know that's going to benefit the sale. And so that's the whole point. It's like, yeah, if I say this, like this, typically this happens. So one way is trying to like figure out that I would try on error, right? Or well, let me just take like 50,000 sales calls and let me map out all the different algorithms. Uh, but I mean, like, I built it out. <laughs> it was painful, but like, okay, <laughs> well, typically, and then I go back to my sales calls, like, mm, this typically happens, or this typically, okay, cool, like, da, 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 da. what can I say? This typically works. So I built it out from start to bottom, you know? So the one you saw was a t- generic version, that's like the template. But the, for the implementation program, what I'm building out is for each offer. For biz op, boom. For business coaching, boom. Like, you know? So, mm. but yeah, I mean, good to hear that it helped. It's, uh, I think not many people are talking about it because people are talking like script versus like no script, like very binary. But I'm just yeah. like, oh, I mean, I just want to do what works. Uh, and I'm not saying it's the best way. It's just like it, it's what got me the outcome that I got, you know. So I'm not saying it's the best. I'm just like, I mean, this this tends to work for me, and then to the degree that I got, and it tends to help other people. So you know, there we go. Oh, that that that's exactly it. You know, it's there isn't definitives. Yes or no in anything. Do you know what I mean? It's coming in, figuring out what's going to work best for you. Now, Brian, if someone wants to come in, they want to get some help from you. I know, you, like you said, you're launching this high ticket thing. Do they still have an opportunity to get in on a low ticket or is that completely shut down? Oh, no, that's not completely done. Yeah, it's not like a fake urgency or scarcity. I'm just like, dude, I got to a point. I have enough people say like, you know, uh, you know, what's funny is that one time I had somebody that was in a doing a one on one. So yeah, like, I don't think I'm gonna keep doing one on one with you because like the school's like so good, you know. So I was like, <laughs> damn. I was like, that was like a moment where yeah, okay. So because the thing with one and I get that too because the thing with one on one is like it's like once a week, but like school is like you get like more touch points like three times a week. But I was like, okay, cool. What if I combine those? Like let me make a hybrid. So like with the high ticket implementation program, it's like more touch points, right? Probably gonna do like five times a week, and then there'll be elements of one on ones involved into that. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, so it's not going to be super scalable in the beginning, uh, but that's okay. Like, I'm probably going to be working, like, a whole lot, whole lot. But, okay, look, let me just do that. But, yeah, to, to answer your question, uh, where can people find me? I mean, just my, my YouTube channel, Brian Choi. Maybe we'll, we'll link it in the descrip- description box below. Of course. Because the uh, enrollment is, like, closed for both the high ticket and low ticket. So, and I'm, I'm serious, I, I shut it down. So, but whenever uh, it does open... Um, but you can, you give, you'll be following me. Like you'll see an announcement on my, on my channel or something like that. And so you can be on the wait list. You can still go like, I think it's school.com slash real cell system. You can 
request to click join and then you'll be on the wait list. And then when it's out, you'll, uh, I'll probably call you or email you to sell you. Uh, and then that'll be fun. <laughs> so there, we <laughs> there we go. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for coming on. There's been some, uh, massive value drops here and I'm uh, excited to see what you continue to do. Um, moving into the future. Cause yeah, there, there's some really cool things coming. I can see it. No, right back at you, man. Congratulations on launching the podcast. You're going to crush it. And uh, yeah, we'll stay in touch. Awesome. Guys, make sure you like, subscribe, and share, and comment below who you guys want to see on the podcast next. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. All right. Peace.